global brewing giant SAB Miller in, in the last hour has come out with its results, its full year results. A few greedy people are saying that they've missed estimates, but I reckon that uh, they've done pretty well. I mean, look at this. We've got lager volumes. Uh, don't forget this is a giant company, 3% ahead of the prior year. Uh, soft drinks volume, 7% ahead of the prior year and reported EBITDA up 12% in... Uh, it, across the board with Latin America and other emerging markets doing extremely well in London is Graham Mackay who's the CEO. Graham, very pleasing numbers. It was a much easier thing to report on your numbers 12 years ago when I first started doing so, but now you've grown so big, difficult to know where to start. Maybe we should start, start with the geographical areas that really stood out for you. Yes, well, uh, this uh, year I think the star performers clearly have been Africa, that's the rest of Africa portfolio, and, uh, and Latin America. But uh, as you would have seen, South Africa itself has produced a, a very creditable performance, uh, as has the Asia business. Um, America and Europe are still seeing difficult economic conditions and difficult industry conditions, um, but our emerging market positions have really seen us, uh, seen us through. Yes, indeed. In fact, what I did this morning uh, quite early, Graham, was go to a couple of analysts that are familiar with your company. In fact, it was almost as though their DNA is woven in, 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 into yours. And I asked what questions uh, they would put to you. And they said, why are you bothering with places like Australia when you're so good at what you do in the emerging markets. And I, when, they make, when they talk about Australia, I think what they're referring to is the fact that uh, beer consumption in that country is, is down. So reference to the Foster's acquisition, I suppose. Yes, I suppose so. I mean, we went through the detailed rationale at the time of the Foster's acquisition and we uh, still think that it uh, passes muster and uh, we're very hopeful about that business. I mean, uh, the point I would make, I think, is that although Australia is clearly a developed uh, economy um, and a wealthy country, it's certainly not in the sort of situation that Europe finds itself in and uh, it has a very strong linkage to the um, emerging markets of the Far East, China in particular. So we think it's much better placed for ongoing health of the beer industry um, than other markets that you could point to, particularly those of Western Europe. It's not like that at all. So we th still think that uh, beer is an exciting category in, in Australia. We think a better job can be done in it than has been done over the last few years. And uh, so we're up for it. We're still very positive about that. Let's stay in that sort of area anyway and look at, look at China and India, also encouraging areas. Uh, your brand in China, Snow, how is that doing? Yes, it's doing very well. You know, there's been a lot of debate about uh, China and the soft landing, hard landing uh, question and so on. I mean, what we are seeing in China is still positive volume growth. Um, it's not uniformly positive every month. There have been some uh, pretty bad um, weather patterns over the last three or four months, but hopefully we seem to be coming out of those now. Overall, the business, uh, it wouldn't be an exaggeration to say it goes from strength to strength. We recently passed the 100 million hectoliter mark uh, for our business in, in China. That's an enormous business. And uh, Snow is by some margin the biggest brand in China and in fact the biggest spear brand in the world. Um, so it would be hard not to be pleased with, with progress there. Yes, and also if you bracket India into that and you look at the EBIT uh, uh, numbers, uh, Asia Pacific, sorry, I'm reading off this, your results only came out 45 minutes ago, as you know, and to go through an enormous amount of paper is difficult, but so I'm reading for this, uh, Graham. Uh, Asia Pacific EBITDA up 30%. India, is that, um, I mean, if you had to look at China and India um, as separate entities, which is um, the most exciting for you over the next uh, decade or so, would you say? Well, they're, they're very different. In fact, they could hardly be more different. Uh, China is, in fact, uh, a huge market and uh, volume, uh, volumes are enormous. Uh, prices are very low in China. They're highly competitive. Uh, pri prices at brewer level in, in China are between a third and a half of what they are in, in most of the rest of the world, including other emerging markets. So China is, is lots of volume and the trick is to try to get some price and better profit performance out of it. India is exactly the opposite. It's a very constrained, regulated market, a very difficult market, very high taxes. 
it's in fact a very small market in volume terms, surprisingly, considering the number of people in, in India. It's growing rapidly, but from a tiny base. Um, and it's very much a fragmented market. It's a state-based market rather than a national market, if you like. And uh, so our current profit performance there is very strong, but as I say, the, the base is tiny. Moving west now, if we can, to Europe. We've been speaking so much on this uh, open exchange show, Graham, about the problems of Europe, and they were highlighted yesterday. I think the Europeans have decided at their meeting yesterday to have another meeting in June. But what I find fascinating is when the, the, the macro and the politics translates itself into performance from companies like yours. Can you tell us about Europe? Because obviously not quite as pretty a picture as the regions we've just spoken about. Yes, uh, Europe is probably the most difficult market that we operate in at the moment, uh, and that would not be unusual amongst uh, big global uh, companies, including consumer companies. Of course, the point I should make is that uh, compared to other global com consumer companies, our direct exposure to the Eurozone is in fact very small. Um, four of our small operating uh, companies are in the Eurozone and we're not in the bigger Eurozone economies um, to any significant extent. So obviously we are concerned about what happens in Europe and uh, we uh, are taking what precautions we can against uh, future eventualities. Um, and the markets in which we have been operating, and which we do operate, are themselves uh, relatively going through relatively difficult times, uh, but they're not in the heart of the Eurozone storm. Uh, America, now before we get to Africa, which is the one I really want to focus on, um, the, the Miller's business, how is that faring for you? Uh, they're holding their own. Uh, profits have been up. Um, uh, the American economy is coming back slowly, I think, as most people know. Uh, the beer market itself is changing just as rapidly, though. Uh, there's a strong move into crafts. Uh, craft brands, the, the market is fragmenting, the big mainstream brands such as ours and our major competitors are under pressure, and we are uh, reorienting the business towards the new growth segments. Uh, that can't happen overnight. So there's a lot of activity, a lot of innovation going on, um, but the, the business is, is, is more or less treading water. It's making some slight progress in, pro in uh, profit terms, uh, slightly down in volumes. Uh, the trends are are a bit more positive, but uh, still not um, not an easy uh, market to operate in. It's very profitable, of course. A but, very mature. Uh, is a bit hard to come by. At the a moment. very mature market, of course. And you talk about going to the craft brands, so there's artisanal sort of brands. But uh, wouldn't there be a, a backlash if SAB Miller got into uh, into brands that uh, were perceived, uh, or you want to be perceived to be uh, craft brands, but everyone looks behind that and say, well, actually, it's SAB Miller, so it's not a craft brand. It must be a very, very difficult strategy for you to formulate. Yeah, that's a very active debate, obviously, in uh, in America amongst the brewers uh, and others. The the fact is, the consumer doesn't really care. We don't think who is behind the craft brands, and in fact, the the biggest craft brand in the U.S. is Blue Moon, which is ours. Um, so, and it, it's it's positioning as craft. It's accepted as craft. It's perhaps not as crafty as uh, some of the products of the really tiny brewery, uh, brewers, but. Um, it does very well in that space. Um, the trick is to add to that with a, a useful portfolio of other brands. Again, to emerging markets, um, it's been a, a great success story, your, uh, your a thrust into um, uh, South America. Which of those regions has done the, which of those countries rather in that region has done, done the best? Is, is, does Colombia stand out? Uh, no, the, the, the best uh, performance in growth terms quite consistently over the last couple of years, the last few years, has been Peru actually. But the Peru business is not nearly as big as, as, as the Colombian business. Colombia stands out for sheer size and profitability, very high margins, much bigger market. Um, so attention tends to get focused on it. But actually uh, within the portfolio consistently over the last four or five years, uh, the star performer has been Peru. 
Okay, uh, we've been speaking to a lot of companies over the last year on this show, uh, Graham, about uh, having ignored uh, or rather sort of dismissed the continent on their doorstep. South African companies wanting to go to Australia and wanting to go to all sorts of other places and the African continent being pushed aside, if you like. How important is Africa to you? Because I'm seeing numbers now uh, on, the, on your results, as I said, they're just out in the last 45 minutes. And it really does look like a very exciting prospect. It's extremely exciting, and I, I should just hasten to point out that uh, we can't be accused of ignoring uh, the African opportunity because we've been investing in Africa um, very enthusiastically and actively ever since we were able to do so, essentially since the start of the fall of apartheid. Um, and so our African business um, is doing extremely well indeed. We have our partners, the Castel Group of France. Um, we have cross holdings with them and between us we account for a very large proportion uh, of all the beer in Africa. Um, I've often remarked that uh, if there were any more of Africa to invest in, we'd be investing in it. So uh, we are following the opportunities as, as actively as we can. The portfolio in Africa uh, in our uh, results just announced, of course, has done very well indeed. and. Uh, we're very hopeful that it will carry on doing that for a long time to come. Per capita consumption in Africa is r relatively low, very low, compared to the rest of the world. And so we think there's a lot of growth to come still. Graham, just one final point now. The, um, the succession plan is in the market, and I think the market on the one hand says, isn't that fantastic that you yourself are going to remain uh, very active? You've been at uh, SAB, you started at SAB Limited in 1978, so you've got a 34-year history at the company, which is now SAB Miller. But there's been certain sort of rumblings about, uh, certainly from the City of London, about you taking the chair and uh, a new CEO coming in, and whether that is, from a governance point of view, the correct thing to do. And from a personal point of view, maybe the new CEO, Alan Clark, might feel a bit intimidated to have someone like yourself almost looking down on them. What, do you th what would you say to those criticisms? Well, uh, there has been some criticism from a, a governance standpoint. I think the, our shareholders themselves and uh, the people who know the situation, in fact, agree that it's a very sensible transition. I think it's very difficult for anyone, uh, Alan included, to come in from running uh, one part of the, the global business into understanding and uh, being able to take responsibility for the whole thing, including our partnerships and alliances around the world. And, and when that logic has been gone through with our shareholders, I think they've been pretty unanimous in supporting it. As far as um, uh, dominating Alan is concerned, uh, I think I should just point out that most of our management are fairly strong-minded individuals. Alan is no pushover and uh, I don't think that he'll feel dominated by me at all and I would expect him to tell me uh, if he thinks that I'm being overbearing at any time. <laughs>